Today, we will listen to three guests who have personal experiences with the events of the Holocaust. Our first speaker is Mr. Ira Sagalowicz, who fled along with his mother from Poland and to Russia when the Germans invaded. His story is one of perseverance and survival in a world torn, torn apart by war. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Sagalowicz. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank the Air Force for hosting us and letting us tell our stories. Um, today, I will tell you about my family's experience and my experience. Um, I was uh, born in a shtetl in Sarny, Poland, and into a large extended family. My mother was one of the youngest child of nine children, and in 1920, uh, two of her sisters uh, immigrated to the United States. This is important because I'll tell you later. <laughs> um, my, uh, uh, in September of 1939, Germany attacked Poland. Poland was defeated in a month, but uh, what you should be aware of or probably know is that um, about a month before, Germany and the USSR, Russia, signed a non-aggression pact. Basically, um, Germany told uh, Rus the, the Russians, look, we're going to start the war, we're going to occupy Poland, and you sit back and don't do anything, don't interfere with us, and, uh, and as a result, we'll give you, you know, we'll give you part of Poland. So they basically divided up Poland before the war even started. Um, so, in, in, you, know, this is, you know, the war started and Poland was defeated in, within a month. And uh, the Russians immediately moved their borders and our town, my town, where I was born, became Russian territory. And of course, the Russians ran it as a military project, and they, um, you know, my, my parents and my father, you know, were under Russian command. Uh, my father was immediately taken into the Russian army, and uh, what had happened is, of course, uh, Russia had occupied Poland many times before, and so the Poles knew how to deal with the Russians, and they were pretty much humane occupiers. What was happening on the other side, on, on the German side of uh, Poland, was immediately concentration camps were set up and people were rounded up and, you know, and people were destroyed and murdered and, and you know, uh, all kinds of atrocities were occurring. And so the population of my town kind of grew from, from what used to be about 35,000, uh, no, three. 1,500 Jewish people to about 7,000 because you know, the people were escaping the, the Nazis into, into Russia. Um, so even though uh, there was an agreement you know, to, to be bodies, about a year and a half later, the Nazis began the occupation of Russia. And they started the war. And because my father was in the uh, army, he was able to get my mother and myself into a train that was heading someplace deep into Russia. And so um, we, uh, you know, one of my first memories is that of my father pushing us into this kettle car. And the kettle car was full of women and children and everybody crying and sitting there on their packs and uh, the train moved out. and. Uh, we were some distance from town when a, a Russian, I mean, a, a German airplane came over and began to strafe the train. The train stopped and people started jumping out of the train uh, while, while the airplane was strafing uh, the train and um, people were running in all directions. Uh, and, and so my mother and I jumped out of the car, uh, the cattle car, and my mother fell, and my, me being a young child, I just kept on running. 
And according to my mother, when she looked up, she saw me quite a distance away, and she saw something explode right over my head. And she started running towards me, and she's screaming, Pavosos ti opkelos, pavosos ti opkelos. Uh, she's talking Yiddish to me. My first language was Yiddish. She's talking Yiddish to me, and so she's running and, and screaming, and, and, you know, uh, and she finally gets to where she saw me, and I was laying beside, say, this hole with the rim of dirt, and I was on the edge of the dirt, and she <laughs> fell on top of me, and she's shaking me. She's, you know, screaming, and I opened up my eyes at that point, and she, you know, I said to her, why are you screaming, mommy? Why are you screaming? And, and she, she hugged me so hard, I can sometimes still feel that, that her hug, you know. It's, it's funny, but you can feel your mother's hug forever. So, you know, we got back on the train, those who could. There were a lot of people dead, a lot of people injured, and we wound up uh, 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 going as far as the uh, Volga River, and uh, we got off uh, on the Volga River. My mother found a, a, uh, a place to work in a, on a farm for, for basically for food. And um, what was uh, happening at the same time is that the Germans had tried to take Moscow. They couldn't. And so they came down and uh, began the attack on Stalingrad. And Stalingrad was close to where we were, so it was time to escape again. And what was happening at the time is that the Russians were mobilizing and moving their war industry deep into the Ural Mountains, deep in, into the Bashkir SSSR. And so there was a, a, a near Ufa, there is a little town called Raivka, and they had a camp over there, a military camp, which they expanded and brought in all the industry that they could, you know, and so all the war industry that they could. So they started building guns and ammunition and tanks, etc. And, you know, uh, of course they needed people. So thousands and thousands of people were brought in, and flimsy barracks were set up, and people were put into barracks. Um, my mother and I were assigned to a, a cubicle in this barrack, which was about nine by nine, and uh, with another family, the Gorky family. And they were a family of, of three, uh, a boy about my age, daughter about 12, and, and the mother. And so the five of us were in this cubicle, and of course, the cubicle had no heat. The only heat in the barracks was at the end of the barracks, and it was a very long barracks. At the end of the barracks, there were some uh, um, kitchens, you know, some stoves where the women would cook <coughs> at the end of the day. And, uh, you know, there was no showers, of course, and of course, our, uh, in the room we had, we had uh, basically two straw mattresses, one for the, for the Gorky family, one for us, and, <coughs> and a bucket, and that was our toilet. Um, the, the, the mattresses, uh, we would roll them up in the morning, put them against the wall, and that would be where we sat on if we had to. Most, you know, so, uh, uh, of course, the, you know, the Ural Mountains are extremely cold and it seldom gets below, uh, you know, it gets above zero, rather. It's always below zero. Um, and they seem to last forever, you know. I mean, I, I, uh, I would say probably about three months of the year is where you have, where you have uh, nice weather, you know, warm weather. Um, it, you know, it's just, it's just horrifically cold. When, when we first got to Raivka, and I remember standing in the room and looking at the at little window that we had, and I said, why would they put a window so high, you know? 
I'm a little child. I can't even look out, you know, the window. You know, it's just so high. Well, uh, first snowfall I found out because it doesn't snow <laughs> inches there. It snows feet and it snows yards and it was always as high as the windows. So, you know, uh, and of course all, all the workers, you know, when it snowed, all the workers were woken up in the middle of the night, whatever time it occurred, you know, and everybody had to clear the roads so people could go to work. Uh, when, we, when we first uh, got to Raivka, our clothes were still nice and, and clean and, and uh, uh, but as time went on, wearing the same thing day and night, uh, around the clock, you know, 24 hours a day, uh, every, everything deteriorates and our clothes began to deteriorate. And my mother, she uh, would bother with other people for items of clothes, you know. I had an additional problem, of course, I was growing. And my pants were short, my, my, my shoes were torn. And, and so my mother, whenever she would find a piece of paper or cardboard, she would put in my shoes to keep the snow out, you know. And, and whenever she gets some item of clothes that she bought it for, she, uh, go, she would go through a process. When, when, we, when we got to Raivka, we had a, a, a uh, sack that all our belongings belong, were in. And one of them was a pot that my mother cooked in, my mother you know, baked in, she did everything, she washed in, all in this one pot. It's surprising how much stuff we have nowadays, <coughs> and, and we can't get along with, you know, without the, all, the, all the necessities, you know, and yet we survived on one pot. So, um, so when my mother would get these items of clothes, she would gather snow, warm up the, you know, make it, turn it into water, boil it, and put that item of clothes into it, because whatever we had was just infested with lice and and and, and uh, all kinds of all kinds of bugs. As I say, my mother worked uh, ten hours a day. And the, you know, the Russians paid the workers on a monthly basis. And every month we would get a sack of potatoes about that big. I was a child, so it was up to here, <laughs> you know, <laughs> on me. And, and um, uh, a, a, about 10 pounds of flour. And my mother had to survive, my mother and I had to survive on that on that Russian. Now, don't misunderstand me. The Russians were not trying to punish us. They just were, didn't have any food. They had a you know, strong front, you know, that they tried to support, and they, they did their best to, to, you know, to provide food for workers. But they just didn't have it. And yet, uh, every month, uh, every time, you know, they had something, uh, trucks would arrive into the camp and every person would get a piece of cheese or a piece of salami, whatever they had, they were handing out. Um, now, as I said, everybody in, in the camp had to work. Uh, children attended school and, and everybody, you know, the rest, all the adults had to work. And they had a quota, they had to perform. Yeah, if you're making bullets, you had to make a certain amount of bullets a day. If you were uh, making uh, turrets or something for the, for, you know, you had to, you had to fulfill. So uh, if, you, if you didn't meet the quota, uh, there was a possibility of getting thrown out of the camp, you know, and your survival rate if you got thrown out of the camp, the camp was zero. Um, but those who exceeded the quota got a reward. And my mother would, uh, uh, Every week, every other week rather, she would come back with this uh, bread, about this bag of black bread, and she would take that bread and she would go through this process of cutting it up into 14 pieces. And she would take the 14 pieces of bread, put it on the windowsill so the Russian bread that doesn't have any, that didn't have any uh, preservatives. So to, to keep it from, from spoiling, she put it on the windowsill, 
and they would become like toast. You know, they called it in Russian, it's called suhari. Uh, <coughs> and um, uh, so we knew each day that we had a piece of bread, you know, so, and yet with all that was happening, there was not enough. Almost every, almost everybody had uh, was showing skin and bones, and, uh, uh, and and myself and my mother were all you know in the same boat, and yet my mother tried to you know tried to supplement our food so with whatever she could find. You know she would find roots or leaves, and she would take the flour you know and put it you know take and mix it up with the, with the roots. And when she would get the roots, she always went through the same thing. She had took the pot and she would beat the root, you know, and beat it and beat it and to try to make it into some kind of a, break it down to, to some, you know, like a flour. And, and she would mix it up with a little bit of flour. And we would, you know, one day we would have root pancakes. And the following day we might have leaf pancakes. Anything to supplement the, the food that we had. Um, the, the, uh, the same with the potatoes, you know, whenever we got the potatoes, you know, my mother would go through a, a process of, ex of examining, you know, the, the potatoes and she would put them in two different piles and I, I, for a period of time, I didn't know why she was doing that, you know. Then I, re I realized, you know, that uh, she was separating the ones with roots and the ones without roots. And so uh, um, we uh, would eat the ones with roots first, you know, and of course when potatoes begin to root, that, that means they're rotting. And of course, so she was willing to give up taste for rooting, uh, for, for extra. Um, so, um, you know, as I say, in my job, you know, every child, uh, you know, uh, in the camp, had a, had a task to perform. We attended school, but we also had a task, uh, you know, and, and my job was to take out the, uh, the uh, waste in the morning. So every, every morning I would take the, the bucket and nine months of the year it was frozen, so it was no problem. I'd go out to the waste pit, throw it out. You know, the other three months you had to walk gingerly. You know, and I used to see the beginning uh, trees, and you know, but as the time went on, the the mice disappeared, and the lice disappeared. I mean, the the rats disappeared, and 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 uh, the animals disappeared, and the trees kept move, moving further and further away. And then, uh, by the time the war ended, I, I couldn't see any trees. It was all kind of done. Um, so, um, but, but uh, as I say, everybody had, had to perform. And uh, um, finally the war ended and uh, no longer was there a need for the war industry. Um, and um, people began to go back to where the home. And the way they went back is walk. <laughs> you know, they walked for miles, for days, for weeks, and you know, and they just carried whatever they could on their backs. <clears throat> um, we finally uh, did that, you know, and uh, had it back, and <coughs> came back to Sarni, only uh, to learn what had happened there. And uh, Sarni was totally bombed out. Just my mother couldn't find the house we were living in. You know, it was just a rubble. Um, and 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 uh, so we were there for a period of time. And as I said, we my mother learned what what had happened. Evidently, as soon as the Nazis came in, they established a ghetto and had rounded up about fourteen thousand people. You know, from surrounding areas and put them in this concentration camp. And then they decided to liquidate the camp. And so uh, they set up machine guns and just were murdering the people. If you go to the internet uh, in 
Google Sarni, you'll see uh, the mass graves around Sarni and where 14,000 people were murdered. <coughs> Among them were my mother's siblings and my mother's, my grandparents and, you know. So when I told you only two people survived from the family, <coughs> uh, there were the two sisters, but also my mother and a, a niece who wound up in Israel. My father, we learned later on, was also uh, killed at Stalingrad. So uh, what was happening at the time is that the Army, U.S. Army set, was setting up displaced persons camps for people who didn't have a place to live, a place to a place, uh, any survival uh, capability, uh, didn't have any food, and, and consequently uh, were, went to DP camps. The DP camps were uh, set up throughout Europe, and uh, we wound up going to a DP camp in Halein by Salzburg. And um, we uh, were there, you know, thinking that we'll, we'll, we'll go to, at that time, we didn't have any documentation. And uh, we, uh, uh, the only place we could get in in the GP camp was to uh, go to Israel. But, um, but while we were there, uh, the Hayas had found uh, my, my two aunts, my mother's sisters, in the United States, and they immediately sent us a visa. And <coughs> uh, we thought we would go to the, to the United States, you know, within weeks or months, you know. Well, we waited five years for a quota <laughs> that existed, you know. Uh, the quota was to, uh, would only allow a certain amount of Jews into the United States. Uh, and, and, and our turn finally came in 1951. <coughs> and so, you know, we finally got on a, <coughs> on a ship that uh, took us uh, to, uh, to the United States. And my, my uh, aunts provided us with a basement uh, apartment where my mother and well, my step, my mother remarried when she was in a, in a camp in the in the DP camp, and she married Aaron Turetsky, who lost both his two children and his wife, and uh, you know, and, and finally, we, as I said, we came to the United States. <coughs> I couldn't speak any English, and I I, I um, uh, um, took me a while to to learn. Well, about four months to, to, to learn uh, yeah. English you know, uh, sufficiently enough to be able to uh, converse and do things, you know. So um, we, you know, and, and as I say, finally uh, I was drafted into, after high school, I was uh, drafted into, into the, well, actually I volunteered for the Army and spent three years in, with the U.S. Army. After that, I went to work for some very <coughs> uh, prestigious U.S. companies, uh, Boros Corporation, putting in the first Air Force tracking system for the U.S. Air Force, and then a lot of satellite communication uh, projects. So, and uh, that's my story. And uh, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>